Hey, don't let me interrupt the fun. It's like good conversations going on. Um, <clears throat> let me start, start with a couple things at the top. Uh, Secretary Blinken spoke earlier today with Qatari Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mohammed bin Abdulrahman Al Thani, to discuss the latest developments in ongoing negotiations to reach a ceasefire deal to the war in Gaza. The Secretary and Prime Minister discussed the remaining issues on the table and practical solutions to bridge the differences between the parties. The Secretary reiterated that the U.S. continues to see a deal as critical to bringing the hostages home and alleviating the suffering of the Palestinian people, and that we stand ready to work to ensure that the deal turns into an end to the war and lasting peace and stability for the region. And then on a scheduling note, the Secretary will now depart tomorrow for Asia instead of tonight, as we had originally planned, <clears throat> so he can attend the meeting between the President and Prime Minister Netanyahu tomorrow here in Washington. We have to accommodate that, reorder the schedule a little bit. He's now going to uh, travel to Laos first and then on to Vietnam, but otherwise the trip will follow the same schedule that we previously announced. And with that, happy to take questions. Saeed. Uh, could you explain when uh, there's going to be a meeting with the Prime Minister? The pri between the President and the Prime Minister? No, no, we know the President and the Prime Minister is going to meet them on Thursday. Tomorrow, but yeah. There's going to be a meeting with the with, uh, the Secretary of State? The Secretary is going to attend the attend meeting, the same attend meeting. The meeting okay. between the President not, and Prime not, Minister. Not a, not a separate, separate meeting, meeting, no. no. Okay. He had Anybody? always planned to attend that meeting, but okay. earlier, uh, that meeting was previously scheduled for earlier in the week. Then, as okay. you know, the, the President had COVID, has right. changed the schedule, so now it's happening tomorrow. Okay. All right, let me start with you, where you began uh, at the very top uh, on, you know, th that he spoke with the Qatari Foreign Minister and so on. So there's still, you know, the outlook or there's still uh, there are signs that a bit hopeful, right? That we might have something, you know, or a deal arrived at maybe in the next few days because we know come next month, the Knesset is going to go <clears throat> on holiday. You know, we will enter the, you know, the election seasons here and so on. So give us your assessment of how the talks are going and what might be the, the, the glitches. What, what are the Optic. So, first of all, I'm not going to put a timetable on, on it, which I know right. you didn't ask for, but you referred to a timetable in the premise, so I want to, right, right. I I wanted to say that. Um, I think that we remain optimistic, but at the same time realistic, which is something yeah. you've heard me say before. Uh, it is important that we have reached a framework agreement and that the two parties, Israel and Hamas, have agreed to the framework that the president outlined publicly uh, some six, seven weeks ago. That was a critical step and a critical uh, uh, thing to get ag agreed. But of course, that's not a full agreement. There are still a number of issues that we need to work through. And we are working through those issues. <clears throat> Obviously, the negotiators themselves are discussing them. The Secretary discussed a number of them today with the, the Prime Minister of Qatar, who of course is one of the, the prime mediators of the deal. And we continue to work through and try to make progress on all of those issues. We want to see a ceasefire as soon as possible because it is the best way to alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people, to get the hostages home, and ultimately bring an end to this war. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, uh, in a couple of hours, in fact, in less than an hour, the Prime Minister will be speaking before Congress, you know, one of the most important places on earth. Uh, do you think that he can? I mean, your assessment, will he take such an, uh, an opportunity to say, okay, I am announcing that we agree to these terms and so on, with whatever caveats he might have? Uh, I do not know what the Prime Minister will say, will say okay. in his speech. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Matt, <clears throat> you know, uh, the UN says that 150,000 Palestinians, uh, you know, flee, flee the new assault on Khan Yunus. I mean, this is, you know, it's almost like the twilight zone. We see these people moving from place to place and so on. I don't you know, it's somewhat apocalyptic, as a matter of fact. So how long should this go on? I mean, you know, suppose we don't arrive at a deal. What is the vision beyond the deal? If there is no deal. You know? We don't want to see the horrific suffering that's happening in Gaza go on another single day. Right. We want to cease fire now. We want it as soon as possible. We want to see one reach between the two parties. And that's why we have been pushing for that for some time and not just pushing but doing the hard work of negotiating and when roadblocks and obstacles come up trying to develop practical ways to overcome those obstacles and present solutions to the two parties to meet Israel's legitimate security needs and also ensure that 
Palestinian civilians are protected and they get the food and water and care that they need. When you look at the, the additional evacuations that have happened over the past week or so, it's heartbreaking to think of what those families are having to go through, to see children picking up and having to move for maybe the second time, maybe the third, fourth, fifth time, and to move from one place that hasn't uh, been safe to other places that might not be safe. Um, the suffering is unspeakable, what, what people in Gaza have been through, and that is why we continue to push so hard to get a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. I know this issue has been raised time and again on the issue of UNRWA, but you know the Knesset advanced uh, um, you know uh, um, legislation that would designate UNRWA as a terrorist organization. Now UNRWA has been responsible <clears throat> for Palestinian refugees for a very long time, since 1950 or 49. So, do you envision like a, a sub, you know, a an alternative to UNRWA? How will you know? How will schools be run? How will clinics? And so on. Let me say a few things about this. First, UNRWA is not a terrorist organization, and we urge the Israeli government and the Knesset to halt the movement of this legislation. We have been clear about the important role that UNRWA plays in delivering humanitarian assistance and other critical uh, assistance to Palestinians in Gaza and throughout the region, not just in Gaza. Um, the, you know, I think you know, United States provides the majority of its funding for, a majority of the funding for humanitarian efforts in Gaza through the UN. We expect to continue to do so. As you know, we are, we are currently barred by statute from providing assistance through UNRWA, but that doesn't mean we don't support the work that they do and we don't support other ways to get humanitarian assistance. So I, I would say, and you've heard us say this before, that the attacks that the Israeli government has le leveled on UNRWA are incredibly unhelpful. They do nothing to advance the cause of getting humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza. So <clears throat> we're going to continue to support the work that UNRWA does uh, in the region, while also recognizing the need for reform, something that you have heard UNRWA and the UN also speak to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, one, one, one last thing, if you could comment on, there's a, you know, about UAE uh, hosting a, a secret meeting with Israel and the U.S. To, for the day after. Could you Said, I think you were sitting right there when I commented on this yesterday. Yes, I, I know, but there, there, I, I understand. But is there yeah. anything? That, uh, no, there's not. There's nothing. I, there's nothing I have that I would add, and uh, you know, that is, goes further than what I said yesterday, which is, um, yes, there was a meeting last week that Tom Sullivan, the counselor of the State Department, attended uh, in the UAE. Um, we were discussing a number of. They were discussing a number of the measures that we want to have in place to implement the various provisions of a ceasefire mm -hmm. and to set the conditions for the day after the conflict. Mm -hmm. And it's part of a number of meetings that we have held and discussions that we've held that the secretary kicked off in January and that the secretary and others in the department have been leading for the past several months, um, primarily focused on security, governance, reconstruction. But of course, as to the particulars of what was discussed, we will keep that private. So, so would you, would quite, you, quite delicate. Would you would you encourage like a UAE or an Arab uh, peacekeeping force? So I'm not going to get into publicly um, exactly uh, the discussions that we are having with our partners about how to best establish security on the ground in Gaza. Obviously, security is, cri is critical. You've heard the secretary speak to this a number of times. In, in the absence of security on the ground in Gaza, you will see the reemergence of Hamas. and so. It is critical, you know, in, unless you're going to have IDF occupation, which is something that we reject, something the international community objects, or rejects, and something Israel says it doesn't want to do. So it's critical to develop a security solution for Gaza. We're working with our partners in the region. We have made progress on it, but I don't want to speak to the details of that publicly. Thank you. Yeah, uh, some. Just a, a couple of things to follow up on from Saeed's questions. Uh, on UNRWA, didn't you uh, announce a ban of, of, you know, before the before this congressional action, you announced that the administration would no longer be funding UNRWA, and as far as I know, never lifted that. We announced a suspension of funding to UNRWA pending the investigation that UNRWA launched. Yeah. Uh, that investigation is still going. But in the interim, b before the time that investigation was finished, Congress enacted a ban. Uh, so your pausing of aid basically precipitated this, like, uh, it seemed to precipitate a situation where everybody pulled funding from UNRWA, and now you're sort of criticizing other people for, for, for 
cutting off on row and no, criticizing the Israelis. That, 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 like that's, that's not that is not what I criticized Israel for. I criticized Israel for, or I criticized the the verbal attacks and threatening rhetoric and uh, advancing legislation, calling them a terrorist organization, which we do not agree with. Other countries, we've always made clear that other countries have to make their own decisions about funding, and we've seen other countries restore funding. Um, uh, we just simply don't have the flexibility to make that decision. Uh, because of the action that Congress took. But the, the investigation and, the, and therefore the decision of this department on whether funding should go to UNRWA from the US is still up in the air. Is there any expectation of when that when that will be done? Uh, no, it is a because it's a it's it's uh, a UN investigation. It's not something that we are conducting, so it's not something that we can put a timetable on. They've had two investigations ongoing. Yeah. One of them finished. One has not. But just to go back to the decision we made, we made a decision to suspend funding to UNRWA after there were allegations made about UNRWA employees having been involved in October 7th that UNRWA told us they found credible. And so when you had, when you had UNRWA telling us they found credible, we thought that was an appropriate step to do, to suspend funding, to fund humanitarian assistance through the, to the Palestinian people through other mechanisms while that investigation proceeded. That investigation is still go, ongoing. Now, in the meantime, as I said, Congress came in and enacted this statutory restriction that bars us from funding UNRWA. But all the humanitarian assistance money that we would have provided to, the Palest to Palestinians through UNRWA, we are providing through other mechanisms, chiefly at the UN and then through, uh, through other uh, non-governmental organizations. Right. Um, and also, just on the, on the question of the, the day after talks in, um, that Saeed, Saeed mentioned involving the UAE, um, some mention uh, in the Washington Post reporting on that of the U.S. playing a coordinating role with this international um, force that would that would uh, be responsible for secure for securing Gaza would be invited in by the PA. These are obviously details. I'm not sure if you'll get into, but but I wonder if if you could sort of address the possibility of the U.S. playing that kind of coordinating role, uh, and separately whether U.S. Uh, security contractors could also be involved in that. Uh, I just don't want to get into, into any of the details at all. I think it's not, not appropriate at this time. Sure. Um, one more slightly uh, separate thing. I just, just on the, on the um, trip planning that you mentioned, I wonder um, <coughs> now that you're basically, the secretary has decided to stay for an extra day to, to attend the Netanyahu meeting. I wonder what the message to, uh, to ASEAN and to, to that region, to Southeast Asia, is that you're also, uh, that means that it was announced yesterday that you would be at, that he would be, um, or sorry, earlier in the week that he would be attending the funeral of the Vietnamese former leader. Now, not going to attend that funeral. Uh, the, it seems like the participation at ASEAN is much shorter than, than was previously planned. This is all happening because the Prime Minister of Israel has decided to come to the US. You know, how do you square that with sort of trying to tell Asian allies, partners in the region, Southeast Asia, there's obviously a really important region that the US is sort of all in on your region. But when a crisis happens in the Middle East, this is a meeting that's, that's run by the, the president. Does the Secretary of State really need to be there? Uh, so I think our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific understand a few things. Number one, that this is the Secretary's 18th trip to the region. It was his first trip as Secretary. Um, continues to be a major priority for, the, for us, and we show that um, not just by our words, but by the amount of time he spent in the region. And as I said, it's his 18th trip. I think uh, they understand that he will be visiting all of the countries that we announced uh, that he's visiting. He will uh, still travel to Laos, to Vietnam, to Japan, to Singapore, to the Philippines, to Mongolia. Um, and I think that demonstrates our commitment, as do, do the investments that we've made in the region, as do the partnerships that we have announced in the region. Um, I think people understand that there was a meeting he had planned to attend, and the timing of the meeting got shifted due to something that you know, could not be foreseen. That's the president getting COVID. And I think they understand that that happens. Um, it happens to a number of foreign leaders where there are unforeseen events at home that uh, mandate a slight shift in the schedule, but we will still be there uh, attending the meetings that we intended to and still traveling to Vietnam to pay uh, our respects, not on the day of the funeral, but the day after to meet with senior government officials. And I think our, under, our allies and partners quite understand. Sure. Uh, I think yeah. uh, certainly understand the importance we place on the region and understand that we have the ability to do more than one thing. At sure. Time. sure, I think that, uh, you know, obviously the secretary's travel has, has been to the region a lot, but the, uh, the president did miss the ASEAN Leaders Summit last year. Uh, <clears throat> that will also be in November this year. Um, is there, do you have a, anything 
you can tell us on, on how the US would be represented at that one, obviously ministerial this week, but the, the leader summit. The summit, no, I, I can't. I would let the White House speak to the president's participation. Obviously, that's still, I think, a couple of months away. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, the overall presence of the US in the region, I think if you look at what we said at the outset of this administration, how we plan to make a major investment of time, of resources, of energy and capacity in the Indo-Pacific, we have borne that out through our actions the past three and a half years, and we intend to continue to do that for the next six months. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> we've been talking about UNRWA, and um, uh, you know, America has very it doesn't have anybody on the ground in Gaza. I just wonder if you had any comment about the rising cases of polio, a disease that's virtually almost eradicated from the rest of the world, uh, rising in Gaza, and also um, hepatitis A. Um, is is there any? Uh, we've you know we've seen American doctors have gone in there to volunteer. Uh, we've obviously got lots of aid organisations. Is there anything else that the United States can do to assist with? Uh, um, reducing the risk of, of disease rising over the next yeah. months. Yeah. Uh, it's like it's hanging a lot on like waiting for the ceasefire deal. But <clears throat> So uh, obviously a ceasefire deal would go a long way towards alleviating suffering because it would make it much easier to get humanitarian assistance and get it moving around Gaza, make it much easier for people to move around Gaza free from uh, the threat of harm. But we have not been waiting for a ceasefire deal to try to address the spread uh, of infectious disease and to address the potential spread of infectious <laughs> disease before we even saw these reports. Uh, our humanitarian, our coordinator for Middle East humanitarian issues, Lise Grand, uh, has been incredibly focused on this. She has worked to try and get um, uh, disinfectant products and cleaning products and vaccinations, uh, vaccination supplies into uh, Gaza. Um, there has been, as you might imagine, right, a decrease in vaccination since October 7th. You imagine how hard it is when people are not in their homes and are not going to school, how hard it is to continue with uh, a vaccination programs. So we've been working to try to get more vaccines for polio and other diseases uh, into Gaza, as well as working um, on just basic uh, uh, sanitary supplies to um, try to deal with the very unsafe conditions that people are living in. So there's a, a lot of work that we have been doing with the UN, something that the, the secretary discussed with Sigrid Cog when they spoke two days ago. Um, so no, we have not been waiting for a ceasefire. Obviously, a ceasefire helps alleviate, helps make easier all of the problems that are plaguing Gaza right now, but we have uh, been working on, on, addressing, um, uh, on addressing the risk for potential disease for some time, even before we saw these reports. And presumably those supplies are suffering from the same problems of not being able to move around it, it, the, yeah, inside I mean, Gaza. It, it, everything suffers from the, from the same kind of threats to lawlessness that make it very difficult to move convoys from Karim Shalom into the to places in in um, southern Gaza or or other places moving around northern Gaza. Um, and, and now with the pier um, being out of operation, is that are air drops continuing at all with the U.S. or is that? Uh, I'm not aware of any, but I would defer to the Pentagon to to speak to that. Yeah, Danny. Thank you, Matt. Uh, two questions: American families uh, victimized by Hamas filed a lawsuit in U.S. federal court demanding $1 billion in compens compensation from North Korea. The argument is that this is because the weapons used by Hamas were provided by North Korea. What is your assessment on that? Is there any reaction from North Korea on this? Um, so, as is, uh, as is the case whenever I get asked about litigation mat matters, I'm going to defer to my, to my colleagues at the Department of Justice to speak to that. Thank you. And uh, another one. Following the Russian Vice Minister of Defense visit to North Korea recently, the Belarus Foreign Minister visited North Korea yesterday. They discussed the military cooperation and arms trade. What effect do you think this will have on the war in Ukraine? So I don't have an assessment with respect to this particular visit, but as you know, we've been incredibly concerned about deepening security cooperation between Russia and uh, North Korea. And if we saw weapons flowing from North Korea to any other country or from any other country to North Korea, that's something we would also be equally concerned about. Do you also, China can uh, 
mediate to a peace talk between Russia and Ukraine because Wang Yi, Chinese foreign minister, invited Ukraine foreign ministers yesterday. So how do you see this? Yeah, so I saw the statement that the the Chinese foreign ministry put out about those talks with foreign minister Kuleba, and I also saw the statement that the um, Ukrainian foreign ministry uh, put out about it, which said that nothing has uh, changed in their position, that they have always been ready for negotiations. They have always been ready for negotiations to reach a just uh, and lasting peace, but that Vladimir Putin uh, to date has shown no change to his war aims and has shown no real willingness uh, for negotiations. So... Uh, our, t- our take on this continues to be what it has been for some time, which is that when it comes to diplomacy, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Thank you. Alex. Thank you, uh, staying on the topic. Uh, Russian drones reportedly uh, uh, fell on Romanian territory last night as they were, they say they were attacking Odessa. Um, if Romania had to fly F-16s in response. How much do you know about it, and what's your response? So uh, my understanding is that the government of Romania is conducting an investigation into this matter. We have full confidence in that investigation uh, uh, into the explosion near their border with Ukraine, and we commend them for the professional and deliberate manner in which they are conducting it. Uh, We will continue to assess and share any new information uh, as it becomes available to us. So are you guys involved in the assessment process? No, it's not an investigation being conducted by us. It's an investigation being conducted by Romanian authorities. Obviously, it's on their soil. If they asked us for any uh, uh, cooperation, of course, we would be um, willing to do that, but it's an investigation being carried out by them. Thank you. Moving to Iran, uh, yesterday marked 90 days since the Massa Act became the law of the land. You guys were supposed to provide us a report, uh, unclassified report, uh, determining you know, those who were supposed to be sanctioned in Iranian leadership. Um, as far as we know, there hasn't been any determination. Um, is there any, any update for us? Uh, let me take that back and get you an answer. Yeah. Um, on Georgia, uh, we yeah. heard from uh, the State Department officials yesterday on the Hill. They were talking about some measures th- that they are uh, planning to take. Uh, but they also said that it remains, I'm quoting, uh, it remains our hope that Georgian leadership will reconsider their actions. Sentiment that I also heard from this podium a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but we're talking about the same regime that is like galloping away from the you know European values. They're talking about, you know, even, uh, you know, they're, they're waiting you out according to, to the latest statements. And they're talking about Trump administration will come in and everything will you know, uh, become bright for us. They are uh, blacklisting you know, Georgians fighting in Ukraine. What gives you hope that uh, they are open to you know, reconsidering their position? So if you've looked at the actions that we've taken, um, we have made clear that we are going to judge the Georgian government based on their policies and that our policies will depend on the actions that they take. And so you saw the secretary announce a review of our relationship with Georgia. You saw him oppose initial restrictions, initial sanctions on officials in Georgia. Uh, That review with Georgia continues. Now, we are always hopeful that any country that starts to backslide on a path towards, uh, backslide on democratic measures or backslides on European Atlantic integration. We're always hopeful that they will change course, especially when you see the people of that country saying that they want to change course. But at the same time that we hope that they will uh, make a change, we develop our policies around the very real contingency that they might not, might not and that's what you've seen us doing. I speak of the actions that you have taken so far. Uh, is there any, any uh, consideration in this building to uh, shift the strategy in terms of naming the names? You know, you did come with sanctions, but Georgian people also saw that you did host their foreign minister here, you hosted their spy chief here, some you know, police officers who actually were involved in the cracking down on opposition leaders. They were actually part of the 4th of July event in, in Tbilisi. So uh, maybe is there any consideration to, to shift that policy? To, to naming names message? from the visa restrictions that we have imposed, for example? Mm-hmm. We're, yeah. It's not a question of strategy, it's a question of law, and we are by law not allowed to, name, to, to release the names of people on whom we've imposed You did visa name for, uh, prosecu- for uh, prosecutors last year when they... It's, it's, know, it, 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 it depends on what you're talking about. The recent restrictions that we have imposed have been visa restrictions, and under U- United States law, we are not allowed to name uh, those people with, uh, on whom we've imposed those restrictions. Is it fair for so, us to expect a second charge soon? Uh, I don't have, as, as always, I don't have any announcements about any measures before we impose Did them. Did name an Israeli guy and be restricted? We did, and if you look back at the, I, I discussed this extensively the day that we announced that. It was because that individual was sanctioned under a different law. He was sanctioned under the law, under the State Department uh, Authorization, or I think it's State Department Appropriations Act, 
which allows us to name individuals. But when we sanction people, when we impose visa restrictions under the authority given to us under the Immigration and Nationality Act, we are required to keep those names confidential. So it depends, there are different, there are different uh, Restrict, there are different sanctions authorities and different provisions of different law, and they give us different, we are, with respect, with respect to the, sanction, the visa restrictions contained in the Immigration and Nationality Act, which are the relevant ones here, we are barred from doing so. Yeah. Okay, I just have one on Iran. Um, CBS has reporting that yesterday there was a rare principles committee meeting at the White House with cabinet secretaries and President Biden. Um, uh, and that there seems to be concern about possible actions that Iran or proxies could take um, while there's a little bit of, um, you know, transitional, well, not a transitional phase, but like whilst there's a lot going on domestically in the US. Um, and then you've also got a, an Iranian president who has said that he's more open to um, talking to the West. Um, and you guys are always saying that diplomacy is, is what you see as the best option moving forwards. Has there been any any outreach or any anything towards the new um, leadership in Iran uh, to, to, to consider reopening any kind of talks on the nuclear front or anything? So it, it is true that we have always seen uh, diplomacy as the best way to achieve a sustainable, long-lasting solution to uh, Iran's uh, nuclear program. But we have made clear that one way or another, we are never going to uh, allow uh, Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. Um, when it comes to diplomacy, um, you know, I, I, when it comes to talks, I think we're a long way from anything that, like that right now, given the nuclear escalations that Iran has made over the past several months, given its failure to cooperate with the IAEA. Um, and also, when you look at the, the new Iranian president, ultimately it's clear that the authority for these matters lies with the supreme leader. And uh, because of that, we don't, uh, uh, we don't judge any change in their behavior likely at this time. But it's always lay laid with the supreme leader, even when U.S. and Iran were talking. So is now not a good opportunity to, to maybe, or is it just that Iran is just not a priority uh, right now? So, no, it very much is a priority. Um, uh, but given the actions that we have seen Iran take, the first thing that ought to happen is for Iran to stop its escalation and start cooperating with the IEA. I also want to um, just say something broad in general about the first part of your question without confirming any kind of meeting that took place, which I would never do. I would certainly hope that any adversaries around the world who think that the United States has in any way taken its eye off the ball because of the announcement by the president. Um, they should know that they are sorely wrong in that judgment, if that is indeed what they are thinking. The president uh, remains focused on our national security priorities. The Secretary of State and the entire national security team remain focused on them. It's one of the things the president said to the secretary when he talked to him uh, on Sunday after his announcement, which is, I want you all focused on the objectives that we have laid out, and I want you to focus on achieving them uh, over the next six months. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Three questions today. One question on the Iraqi and U.S. security dialogue, which concluded yesterday. I know the Pentagon is the mainstream of that discussions, but the State Department delegates were there and they attended the meetings. One question that the Iraqi people want to have an answer from the U.S. State Department, the U.S. government, and the U.S. Pentagon is, what's your position, what's your idea about having a timeline, having a deadline for the U.S. withdrawal in Iraq, which the Iraqi delegation came here with the idea for at least having a deadline or having a timeline for that withdrawal. But we didn't see anything from the joint statement that just published by Pentagon. Do you have anything it, so, exactly on that? So let me just, just say, so the, the meetings that were happening uh, the last few days here in D.C. are the through the joint security cooperation dialogue that we have established with Iraq. Um, the question about the United States military pre presence in Iraq is something that we are discussing separately with them through the Higher Military Commission. That is an ongoing discussion with them. And as I said yesterday when I got a uh, sim similar question, is a process that we have set up with the government of Iraq to determine the coalition's military mission, how it will transition based on the following factors, threat from ISIS, operational and environmental requirements, and capabilities of the Iraqi security forces. So those are discussions that are happening in a separate channel from the one that, that met here in Washington the, the last um, couple of days. The discussion is still ongoing. That they are. Yeah. Okay. And two, two more questions on 
Rojava, northeast Syria. I'm wondering if you have changed your position about the election in northeast Syria, which was uh, rescheduled to be held in August. And you were objected to that election. Have you changed your position on that election? Uh, I don't have any new, new position to announce, no. Thank you, Matt. You declared Bangladesh a level four most dangerous zone for traveling. Mass atrocities are occurring under the regime's shoot on site order, with the death toll surpassing 200. Students are carrying out peaceful protests. What specific steps is the U.S. going to take to rescue the innocent student and the nation from the brutal regime? Uh, so, first of all, again, we have made clear our concerns about the ongoing security situation um, uh, in Bangladesh. We announced uh, the other day that we are exploring all options to ensure the safety of our personnel in Dhaka. Um, we authorized the voluntary departure of non-emergency personnel and family members uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Dhaka. Uh, the embassy does remain open to provide consular and other services to United States citizens who are uh, in Bang Bangladesh. Uh, and with respect to the safety and security of any American citizens, obviously that is our first priority. Um, and we, we encourage any U.S. citizen um, uh, who um, is worried about their safety and security, has concerns, is anything you want to discuss to contact our embassy. Is the U.S. Embassy full operation in Dhaka? Uh, it, is, it is operational. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the Biden administration has recommended uh, more than $100 million for Pakistan to strengthen democracy and fight terrorism. Could you provide some details, please? Uh, some details of the, sorry, of the, I thought, I, usually I can, you have sorry. a longer question, so I, I thought can, there was I a- I can repeat the question. Uh, 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 so, um, I would just say, I'm not, you know, for exact details, I can follow up with you in more length, but um, the, we did just make a budget request to Congress to, um, uh, for $100 million, $101 million to Pakistan to strengthen uh, democracy and fight terrorism. We would use that for the types of programs to strengthen democracy and civil society, to counter terrorism and extremism, to support economic reforms and debt management. Um, we have made similar budget requests and similar budget authority, uh, or received similar budget authority from Congress in the past and may, and invested, used the funds that were appropriated by Congress to invest in our partnership um, with Pakistan, and we would use uh, funds, should they be appropriated by Congress, uh, to invest in similar programs as we have in this fiscal year and in previous ones. Sir, Indian media is reporting that in few states, the BJP government is forcing Muslims owners of restaurants to, to display their Muslim names at their eateries, but due to growing hate against Muslims, they fear it will bring more problems for them. What are your thoughts when you see such kind of actions by any government? Uh, so we have seen those, those reports. We have also seen the reports that the Indian Supreme Court on July 22nd in, issued an interim stay on the implementation of those rules. So they're not actually in effect now. Um, at, speaking generally, we are, uh, as we always say, committed to promoting and prom uh, respecting universal, uh, promoting and protecting, I should say, universal respect for the right of freedom of religion and belief for all anywhere in the world. And we have engaged uh, with our Indian counterparts on the importance of equal treatment for members of all religious communities. The U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom once again urged Biden administration to list India as a country of concern. Uh, this request has been ongoing for the past three years. Uh, according to several U.S. commissioners, uh, their visas have been denied uh, by Indian High Commission in D.C., uh, they wanted to go there to monitor the ground realities on religious freedom. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so I'm not going to speak to a specific visa um, decision. I'm not aware of the facts of, it, of those specific things. But when it comes to uh, religious freedom designations, that is a process that we take seriously. And we announce the conclusions every year in our annual report. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> my colleague just asked you about the 101 million you have announced. Uh, requested the Congress for uh, Pakistan for democracy. But at the same time, uh, Congressman Brad Sherman has tweeted and mentioned about his meeting with Under Secretary Donald Liu uh, once again to go ahead uh, to tell the ambassador in Pakistan to go and meet Imran Khan. Uh, 101 million democracy funds, but the biggest leader in the country is languishing in jail for one year, and the U.S. ambassador is not meeting him, despite the Congress telling him. Uh, uh, how do you see this? 
How do I see it? So first of all, uh, Donald Liu comes up more in this briefing than any assistant secretary in the building. I don't know how many times I've gotten questions about him. Uh, I'm not aware of, you said it was a tweet from Brad Sherman. Haven't seen this, this tweet, so uh, I can't respond to it. I would say, uh, as you know, because you and I have discussed this issue on a number of occasions, um, internal political matters in Pakistan are something that we do not take a position on. Um, we urge respect for democracy, respect for hu human rights, and, and uh, treatment of all political parties equally. Okay. Um, my just one more. Um, although I don't agree with the, I, I do not think that Congress is going to approve your request while uh, the way democracy is being treated under this administration. But my second question is about uh, first time uh, now a girls' school is blown up in North Waziristan, the tribal areas uh, that I belong to as well. So I have mentioned to you that Talibanism is expansion is, is expanding in that region. And I know the president, this administration has been under tremendous work since Ukraine war, now Gaza. Um, but is there any like serious concentration being paid to this whole terrorism spread? Like uh, this is the same time, by the way, when Malala was shot. And like, so that whole thing about girls' education has now passed from Afghanistan and has jumped into Pakistan as well. So you started your question referring to the United to our administration requesting additional funds to fight terrorism in Pakistan and then ended it by questioning our commitment to fighting terrorism in Pakistan. No, I think I, was, I, 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 just, I, I think I would just suggest that in this case the question answers itself. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, our situation about Bangladesh already last seven days we are talking here. Uh, the Once Bangladesh was a, a safe haven for terrorist organization like JMB, Harkatul Jihad, with the help of uh, U.S. government, uh, the Bangladesh government made impressive progress in countering terrorism with the support of U.S of course I told, but uh, the recent days, huge number of militant elements have destroyed a significant large-scale government and public properties, including uh, institute and brutally killed uh, not only innocent people, but also law enforcement agencies with the deliberate plan to topple the current government. One of the most concerning issue for USA and Bangladesh, also for Indo-Pacific zone, that they have attacked one of the major prison and released nine convicted leaders of their militant outfit, who were the think tank and brain of the terrorist activities in Bangladesh. Given the recent violent activities, where militant element and anti-government political parties have caused significant destruction, and does the State Department believe this action will escalate terrorism in Bangladesh? And how does the US plan to support again the Bangladesh government to, for the effort to maintain stability and counter these terrorist so, threats in Bangladesh. So let me try to make this clear because I've said it the last couple of days. We condemn all recent acts of violence in Bangladesh. We support the freedom of peaceful assembly. We condemn violence against those who are exercising their peaceful right to assembly. And we condemn violence on behalf of any protester who has turned their peaceful uh, exercise of assembly into an excuse for, for violence. We can end violence in all cases. Of course. We want pe the people of Bangladesh to be able to exercise their uh, uh, fundamental freedoms the same way we want people all over the world to do to be able to exercise their fundamental freedoms. And we want to uh, we continue to urge both protesters, private citizens, and the government to refrain from violence. Any comment on that portion released of nine convicted leaders of militant outfit? Because these I, are not I, I these are not regular. I, I, I don't have a specific comment on that. All right. Um, and with that, I think do you have one. No. I think we're up for today. Thanks, everyone.